show, we're back, 3 o'clock rock, back from the park, Tamarind Park, where we did Think Tech on, in the park on the street. That was a fabulous. If you ever have a chance to watch that, you should. So today we're doing Life in the Law here in the 3 o'clock block with our friend of many years, John Edmonds-esque, who's an attorney at law in the Davies Building and has been there a long time. In fact, he and I were admitted in the same year, 1968. Uh, he attended Stanford undergraduate USC Law School, and he has been practicing, I, I suppose, in litigation and largely in big cases for all those years. Do the math. Hi, John. Hi, Jay. Good to be back. Great to have you here. He's a regular contributor on Think Tech. So, uh, you know, this is very important, and we need to know where you're coming from. So you're an appellate litigator in large part. You do big cases, big trials, and big appellate litigation. Talk about your background. Well, I started with the oldest firm out here. It was in Robertson, Castle, and Anthony. Uh, I spent about two and a half, three years with them, went on to open my own firm, and uh, actually then took a an invitation from Brooke Hart to come over to the public defender's office, and I was chief deputy public defender for two years, then went back into private practice. Along in there, uh, I got involved in some cases against the United States government. Now, I never had to sue the president, but I did sue the Secretary of the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, uh, all the, and the, then again, the Secretary of the Navy and all the ships at sea, along with Stan Levin. There's a very interesting case that came Those up. Those were the days. Well, they, they passed a... Uh, a decision came down that said that any person anywhere in the United States, any citizen who was ever charged with a crime, uh, where the crime could involve imprisonment, you didn't have to be sentenced into prison or jail, just if it could involve it, uh, had the right to a lawyer. So we brought suit on behalf of all the ships at sea with all the uh, enlisted men and naval fellows out there, and there were no women then. Uh, and we got an injunction from Martin Pence saying they, uh, we sued saying they could not uh, hold what was called a captain's mass. The ships at sea, as you know, somebody acts up, they don't, you don't have a, a courtroom, you don't have a judge, they have a thing called captain's mast, and they hold you up and put you in the slammer. That was uh, in... Uh, Mutiny on the Bounty, that's, remember he locked up the mess boys for uh, t stealing the strawberries? That was the captain's mess. Well, this, you know, that gives us the flavor. I mean, John uh, started out in some very adventurous, may I say, litigation. We uh, won that, by the way. Of course you did. And he's won a lot of cases since. And the case has been at the trial level and at the appeal level. They've been state level. They've been federal level. They have involved uh, parties from all over the country and the world. Um, he is a primo litigator. And that's why we wanted to talk to him him about what happened in the state of Washington, what happened with that TRO, uh, what happened with the Ninth Circuit. So let's go through it. First, what, what was the order? I mean, it just summarize for me the order that was the subject, the, the president executive order that was the subject of the case in Washington. Well, the president issued a, an executive order that had the, he thought, the force and effect of law. Uh, and they normally do if they're constitutional, uh, banning uh, certain uh, visa holders and others who didn't hold visas who wanted to come into the United States. And I think everybody out in the public knows there were, I think, six or seven countries that were, anyone from those countries could not come in. Anyone holding a, already holding a U.S. visa uh, who was a citizen of one of those countries but had a, an already pre-approved visa where they'd been vetted, couldn't come in. And he left out about six or seven other countries where he felt that the threat of terrorism was not as great. Now, all this was predicated on his belief and finding in the executive order. He recited the fact that he believed that terrorism was a great threat to people coming in from those countries. Uh, and of course, as we all know, he had previously said during the campaign that he wanted a ban on all Muslims from coming into the yes, United States. Yes. And, and the, the executive order itself split and excluded a series of uh, Muslim countries and included others. And that was one of the things they went to court over. We'll get to that. So yeah, let's talk about that. So Washington, state of Washington, and it's a special state in many ways, and the Attorney General of Washington uh, filed an action in the United States District Court uh, for Washington, I guess in Seattle. Seattle. Um, seeking, among other things, a TRO. Can you, can you talk about the basis of that case and what they were seeking in the way of a TRO and other relief? Well, the basis was, you, you'll note that there were no individuals who filed that suit. There was nobody holding a pre-approved visa 
who was from one of those countries, who was going to the University of Washington, who wanted to come in. And, but uh, the attorney general there filed suit on behalf of the state of Washington, claiming that there were enough students who had visas who would have otherwise been allowed to come back into Washington. Some, I think, were medical students or uh, intern doctors, uh, but who were employed by the state. And he asserted, the attorney general asserted on behalf of the state, that the state would lose a, a tremendous amount of not just revenue, but the professional efforts of these people, the, the work they did that contributed to the society in Washington. Now, the uh, U.S. government opposed that. You mentioned a temporary restraining order. I'd like to take a minute and Please. explain what a temporary restraining order is. Uh, one thing about our system of justice is that it's premised on the idea that if you go into court, you and I are in a fight, who knows, you're rearing my car, I need to sue you. You file a lawsuit, and the, the usual route that any lawsuit takes is each side gets notice of it, gets a lawyer or not, comes into court, and everything that's done is heard by a judge who hears both sides. There's a big exception, though, and the exception is what leads you to a temporary restraining order. The exception is if something's going on that is so unusual and is threatening life, liberty, or property, and there is not time to go find a judge and hold a hearing, the party who claims this is going on can go in and apply for a temporary restraining order. Now, you can't just walk down to the courthouse and fill out a, a, a form. You have to go under oath, uh, file an application. A, a graphic example of something that doesn't happen anymore, but it, one would be if you were a an attorney and you knew that a client of yours was in the in jail and was being, they were trying to beat a confession out of him. They literally were on him at the time. And you had witnesses who'd come out and they'd seen it, but it was um, Saturday, Sunday night, you couldn't do anything. You could go down and file a temporary restraint. All by order. yourself. All by yourself. The theory being that what's going on is something, you can't wait to go to court. You can't come into court two weeks later and say, well, they were beating my guy up. He can sue for damages, but he can't stop the infliction of this irreparable, irreparable harm. harm, which is what's in the law. You have yeah. to, you don't have to show irreparable harm. You have to show a, well, you do irreparable harm, which would be somebody cutting down a tree in your backyard, the police beating on a prisoner who's confined, can be any number of things, but irreparable injury. And you have to show a substantial likelihood of success on the merits. And that's something that the Ninth Circuit opinion talks about that in this case, a lot of people who talk about it just said you had to show a likelihood of success. It's not a likelihood, it's a substantial likelihood of yeah. success on the merits. So what were they seeking on the merits? I mean, what is the state of, forget about the TRO yeah. for a minute, what was the case in general seeking? Was seeking a judicial declaration that the president did not have the power to issue this executive order, mm -hmm. this blanket executive order. That later came out that if he narrowed it, done it a certain way, it might have passed muster. We're not, no, nobody's there yet. But what went to court with the judge in Washington was, did they get a temporary restraining order? And he issued a temporary restraining order. The he found there would be irreparable harm if he did not take action on this executive order right now. Right now, for a series of reasons. Uh, but one of them was he believed that there was a religious basis for the ban. The executive order itself is something that Trump administration is trying to make a big deal out of, but the order itself doesn't talk about Muslims. But I think we all remember that uh, there was a tape shown of Rudy Giuliani dur recently uh, during the convention, or uh, sorry, after after the convention, after uh, Trump was elected president, saying uh, President Trump came to me and told me to write an executive order that was Muslim proof. That we, we'd ban Muslims, but you wouldn't use the word Muslim, which is what he did. Uh, and I should put my cards on the table. I'm very uh, staunch Democrat, always have been. I'm very opposed to the election of President Trump, but I'm trying to analyze this neutrally, mm -hmm. as I think the, the Supreme, the, uh, the um, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals did. Okay, so the so uh, Judge, what was his name? Robart. Robart. Uh, in the, in the uh, in Seattle, in the state of Washington, Washington yeah. at the request of the the government of Washington, yeah, the, the state's state government, attorney, attorney general representing general, the state of Washington, uh, issued the temporary restraining right. order. That's all he did. That's all he did. Okay, and this was a problem. Um, so I guess the government took that up, appealed that to the Ninth Circuit. Yes. And they wanted to uh, set aside the temporary uh, restraining. Temporary restraining 
executive order. Now, so what arguments did they make? Well, first of all, that's a very rare thing to do, and it's almost a certain loser. Just statistically, looking at that, uh, they made the argument that the, the president, they claimed, had the authority to issue an order like that and was free from review by a court. That's amazing. It is remarkable. And the Ninth Circuit said <laughs> there is absolutely no precedent to support the claimed argument that the president has unreviewable authority, and they emphasize that it, quote, runs contrary to the fundamental nature of our constitutional democracy. Now, presidents have a lot of authority, and uh, it comes down to courts that will give them more discretion than they'll give anyone else. But the president does not have the authority to violate the Constitution. The court was very troubled, as was Judge Robart, that there appeared to be a, a Muslim ban. The uh, establishment clause of the U.S. Constitution, no, no law uh, interfering with the relate, right to religious freedom, you can't single that out, and it, it looked as if he had. So the, the, uh, the, 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 the position expressed by the, the United States, by the uh, what, the Attorney General of the United States in taking Actually, this up the, to the uh, Ninth Circuit. Solicitor General, was it? Solicitor General. Solicitor General? No, I'm sorry. Oh. He, he, Solicitor General goes before the Supreme Court. It was uh, the Justice Department. Justice Department took. The, the position they took in the Ninth Circuit was that th this was not reviewable. Not reviewable. That, that the executive order had to stand because it was the President's decision. The President had a right to do it. There was a point in the oral argument where both in front of Judge Robart and before the Ninth Circuit, each of them asked the attorney arguing the case for the U.S. government, are you claiming that the president has the authority to do this and that, that no court can review it? And there was a long pause. I'm sure. And the answer came down, yes. Wow. Wow is right. And that was really what all this has turned on. Okay, so a three-judge panel. It wasn't the whole Ninth Circuit, no, which was, what, 20-odd judges? Right. Um, 27. 27 I judges. Just the three judges. How were the three judges selected? They're randomly selected. Mm. I, I've argued in front of one of them. I know one. I don't know the other. But they, two Democrats and a Republican, all very fine judges. President Trump's come out and said, oh, they're, they're biased, they're this, they're that. You can't count on them. It's a politicized court. Anything but. He criticized Judge Robart. Uh, he did, uh, indeed. For being a so-called judge. Yeah, so-called yeah, yeah, insulting. Yeah. The, um, one of the judges on the three was uh, Judge Rick Clifton, who sat in this chair a couple uh, months ago. So uh, I mean, he's, and he, he's uh, definitely uh, from Hawaii, uh, still has big connection to Hawaii. He was a very and prominent he, partner in a uh, very prominent law firm. Here. Yes, he was. And so, no, no uh, certainly you wouldn't call him a flaming liberal. He's a very solid judicial thinker, uh, I think straight down the middle on his cases. Yeah. yeah. So um, they heard that. They heard the argument that three judges, uh, what did they do? Well, they ruled unanimously, uh, starting with what I just read you. They, they reviewed the facts in detail. It's a 28-page opinion. Uh, they got into a lot of the procedural minutiae, but they found irreparable injury. Well, first they found re reviewability. They, they can't go anywhere unless they can decide that it's reviewable. The government also challenged standing. The U.S. government said that the uh, Attorney General of the state of Washington did not have standing to sue on behalf of the visa holders. And that was actually the first thing the court took up. And that's where the court said these are students. They're enrolled at state universities. They contribute to the gross national uh, gross uh, state product of that state and they the state can assert an interest on their behalf i'm summarizing what was about a five-page argument mm -hmm. then they move to the issue of what we call reviewability does the court have the power to review conduct by the president when the president says they don't have it hold right there john because that's a cliffhanger it is we're going to take a short break and we're going to come back and we're going to find what the ninth circuit thought about reviewability in this case we'll be right back Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Hi, this is uh, Jane Sugimura. I'm the co-host for Condo Insider, and we're on Think Tech Hawaii every Thursday at 3 o'clock. And we're here to talk about uh, condominium living and uh, issues that affect condominium residents and owners. And I hope you'll join us every week on Thursday. Aloha. 
Aloha, I'm Bill Sharp, your host for Asian in Review, a weekly um, show right here on Think Tech Hawaii that's devoted to substantive analytical discussion about contemporary events in Asia. By Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii west to Pakistan and from the Russian Far East south to uh, Australia and New Zealand. back. We're live. We're here with John Edmonds. We're delighted to be here with John Edmonds uh, on life in the law, uh, talking about what happened in the Ninth Circuit over the uh, president's executive order on immigration. <clears throat> so uh, cliffhanger was, gee, they had to make a ruling on reviewability of the TRO that came out of Judge Robart's court in, the, in Seattle. Uh, what did they decide and on what basis? Well, they decided it was reviewable. I, I read you that quote about it being unheard of. They said, we find no precedent anywhere in the jurisprudence of the United States states for the Supreme Court being unable to review conduct of the president. Again, there are a lot of cases that say they should give him great deference in certain areas. But they found in this case, partly because they thought there was motive for passing a Muslim ban, even though they called it something else, they thought that was one indicator. Uh, they also talked about, it was an interesting procedural and, and substantive point, uh, procedural points can sometimes be very important. I think it was in footnote eight of the opinion, the court, the three-judge court said, the executive order that was signed by the president wasn't the final one that went into effect before they issued it. They found something in it that they went back and corrected, only the president didn't correct it. Somebody on his staff, an attorney on his staff, uh, in the counsel's office, went in and corrected it, and the president didn't sign it. You can't do that. In other words, that itself was a flaw. Non-delegable. Non-delegable flaw. Now, the, they made clear in the opinion they would have issued the TRO, uh, affirmed the TRO anyway, but they talked about how inadequate it was, and again, they kept coming back to this idea that the government, U.S. government, was telling them they couldn't review what the president did, and it goes to probably the most fundamental axiom in our democracy. We all heard this in high school, grade school. You have three divisions or three branches of government. You have the executive, judicial, and legislative. Legislative passes the laws. The uh, executive uh, signs them. Uh, is the last word about do you approve a piece of legislation. The executive negotiates foreign policy, etc. But the courts make a decision about whether the laws are valid or enforceable. And it, it, it gets down to, what if, what if the Congress passed a law uh, that married people couldn't sleep together? They made it illegal. And that's, I mean, people use that as an example. Could the Congress pass a law that said married people couldn't sleep? They make it a crime. Uh, we all are shocked by that, I hope, I think. Uh, that would be unconstitutional. It interferes with basic freedom freedoms that are guaranteed under the U.S. Constitution. But if the Congress ever got crazy and did that, and there was a Supreme Court justice once who said, I, I'm a, not, not in an opinion, but he said, I'm of the view that if the um, court did it, uh, if the legislator did it, uh, the legislature or the people would have to unwind it. Court couldn't touch it. So you, you get into an inner, can, can they make it thing illegal? Uh, can the Secretary of the Navy say to all the ships at sea, uh, you can charge these guys with stealing strawberries, you can charge them with minor crimes, but you can't give them a lawyer. That's when the court has to get into it. When it is the president, he is, is no more above the law uh, than anybody else out there. But let me ask you, John, in matters, for example, of um, diplomatic relations, in matters um, you know uh, that that are customarily reserved for the president yes. that don't involve domestic situations that don't involve at least um, in any obvious way the rule of law in this country they are discretionary decisions they are decisions about the relationship of this country to other countries uh, would not wouldn't that be unreviewable would you permit for example somebody who didn't agree with a domestic with rather with a, uh, a diplomatic question uh, decided by the president, would you give him the right to go to a district court and get a TRO against what the president has done in diplomacy? Well, again, I come back to what the three-judge panel here said. They said there's no basis 
in our constitutional history or in our constitution for the right of the president to do that in this sort of an area. Now, what would happen, for example, if the, you have to think of extreme cases because the president is given an enormous amount of authority. Uh, it's subject to, in some cases, the, the most strict limited review. One area where there's no re review is nuclear weapons. It, you know, people talk about the president has his finger on the trigger and you can't stop him. That's not reviewable. Well, if there were, there was no time. <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> no, but it is not, <laughs> not reviewable. Uh, but that's not an order that is issued in writing. It's an action that's simply taken that yeah. he's been given the power to yeah. enforce. Yeah. But suppose, for example, he was going to Russia, and he announced before he went, I will not sit at the table with any anyone of Chechen background or anyone who's Jewish or uh, Roman Catholic or Greek Orthodox. Something that shocks the conscience. Something that shocks the conscience. Would that be reviewable if, if he were to announce it? Would it? In my opinion, it, it would. You'd, you'd have trouble with standing. You know, who's got standing to bring that? Uh, because it's being done outside the United States and the president is typically given the authority to uh, negotiate foreign policy, as, as you've discussed. Uh, no, no president would ever say that, but in effect what you have the court here saying is no president would ever say that we can't review his conduct and no president would ever slice up countries where you get visas and don't based on a motive to exclude Muslims. Yeah. So now the Ninth Circuit, they didn't allow for an exception here. They said, no, we can review, the, the federal court well, system can review all actions of the president. No, th there are some areas where the, the doctrine is he has wide discretion, uh, not carte blanche, but reviewed under a very, very strict standard. Uh, I talked about the, if somebody, they're beating a guy up at the prison. That's reviewed under a, a much more strict standard than the president setting uh, foreign policy, or if he'd done this one properly. But they, where he does something this wide and this far reaching, and there's a religious basis for it, or religious motive, really. Uh, you know, they carefully left the word Muslim out, but it's clear what they were aiming at. Uh, it is reviewable. It doesn't admit of a non-reviewability exception. Well, on a you know, common sense basis, we all knew what he was doing sure. because he'd been talking about it for a year. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, uh, it strikes me that this is one of those areas where we're pushing the legal envelope and it's only three weeks into the administration. Well, we're finding out new ways, new things we have to interpret, new rules we have to make, new exceptions, new limits. Uh, it's amazing, isn't it? Well, yes. The uh, question is, who's pushing them? Uh, this, this, is not, <laughs> this is not the first time that a president has challenged the authority of the courts to review his conduct. It happened with Harry Truman and the steel mills. It happened much more recently with President Nixon in the Watergate case. Remember, he did not want to turn over the tapes, and an order came down saying you can turn over the tapes. Now, when that case went up, I know you're going to ask me what I think is going to happen to this case I'm on about appeal. to ask yeah, you that. We're going to get what we're there. Uh, when the, the uh, Watergate uh, tapes came up, uh, and he, uh, he was ordered to turn over the tapes, scholars around the country were debating wh what the opinion was going to be in the U.S. Supreme Court. Remember, Nixon said later, when he was interviewed after he'd been, uh, impe well, he, after he'd resigned from office under threat of impeachment, uh, he said, uh, if the president does it, he can't be a crime. Now, that's something like what President Trump is saying. He's not talking about a crime, but... Uh, unreviewable. Yeah, unreviewable. And when that case, when the uh, Watergate tapes case went to the U.S. Supreme Court, a lot of people were going back and forth, a lot of journalists. Well, you've got so many Republicans on the court, they were appointed by Republican presidents. Some of the, some of the appointees were Nixon's own appointees. Uh, a brilliant constitutional scholar came forward and he said the opinion will be unanimous because it has to, to be. be. It has to be unanimous yeah. because it's what our country now, Does that apply is. here? Does that apply here and now? Because one yes. way or the other, this is probably going to get to the Supreme Court. Yes. Uh, whether this, whether the uh, Justice Department appeals the Ninth Circuit, which I guess they haven't done yet, um, right? They've got to file papers to appeal. Do they do that? Well, they haven't appealed the TRO. Whether they're going to the appeal the decision of the Ninth Circuit. Well, that is the decision of the Ninth Circuit on the TRO, but there's a choice here. Do you go back down and try the case, or do you appeal only the 
grant a temporary right. restraining order. Yeah. And in my view, strong view, big mistake to appeal only the grant of the restraining order. I think the uh, Supreme Court would probably turn it down or certainly find yeah. that it was, uh, would affirm it. Because what have you got? You've really got this naked assertion by the government that the conduct's unreviewable. And just as in the Pentagon right. Papers cases, they're not going to stand for Without it. Without a showing of evidence. Without that was yeah. part of it. Yeah. That's right. That they, the Trump administration never shown evidence that they required this for now, it, national security. If we can skate in that direction for a minute. What, so We only have a minute. All right. Suppose you suppose you go back down now and you try the case. The Attorney General for Washington said, we're ready, and when we go, we're going to start taking depositions, we're going to serve interrogatories, and people have been talking about, we want to see the President's tax returns. We want to see his financial dealings. The way you could do it is you go back down and you ask to take his deposition, you serve interrogatories, and you say, we want to see those things. How is it relevant? What does that have to do with anything? Well, remember, he imposed the ban as to some countries, not others. One of the countries where he didn't didn't seek to invalidate the visas was Saudi Arabia. It's acknowledged that he has business dealings in Saudi Arabia. Does he there ha therefore have a motive to have exempted Saudi Arabia based on his own Ooh. personal financial conditions? Very interesting question, yep. and the answer could shock the conscience too. So, um, you know, I guess what you're telling me, John, is it's not over? Oh, no. It is not over by a long shot. It's been pushed into the back a little by the uh, forced resignation of Flynn. Whether you, It was a resignation yesterday. Today it was forced. But <laughs> okay. uh, that's a, a bigger crisis heading our way. Uh, this one's it's not, not over either. No, it's not. It's just starting, I think. Who, the big, big question they're asking is, what did the president know and when did he know it? But uh, this one uh, is not going away. Well, that means you have to come back and talk about what happens now, John. It's not over for us either. 